Yeah, and thanks everybody for staying for the last uh, track. It's pretty cool. So, um, quick, uh, quick kind of guest participation before we get started. So, this this talk is a lot about you know going from tech to exec, from IT to more of an executive level, and conversations between the two, and kind of a little history lesson with me and my experiences um, that hopefully you'll be able to learn from and not do the same things twice that I did if I did them wrong. So quick show of hands, who, who's on the exec side, whether it's a president level, CEO level, C-level, anything like that? Any execs? None, okay. How about uh, middle management, whether it's manager, 10 years of experience, you know, just been doing this for quite a while? Couple? Okay, what about more of the entry level, just getting started? A few more? Anybody had to have no experience whatsoever? And the rest just don't, oh, here is your hands like me, so that's cool. All right, <clears throat> I get it. So this is a little bit about me. Um, things to point out here, uh, you know, if you look way down there, telling stories, um, I'm, I'm, I've been a teacher for 15 years. So, uh, you know, full-time job in IT, I've had a full-time job in security. I went up and down the organization ladder. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute, but really, I like sharing stories, and again, I like making people aware of what's going on. So here's kind of what we're going to walk through. Um, again, these experiences are specifically to me. They may be not normal to everybody else. But like I said, I've had a lot of interactions with executives and with very non-technical people. So I used, I've taught lots and lots of computer classes. Um, had one particular example. A guy came in, got done out, out of a three-hour class. And at the end, it was a computer class. He said, OK, I got this thing here. How do I turn it on? So. I've had a lot of experience communicating with people that have just no idea to the people that are the executive level where they need certain things. So we'll talk about some of that journey, some of those experiences, um, some keys to successful communications. Um, we'll talk about some few magic words or some buzzwords. Um, and then we'll talk about how to create that bridge, how to go from an IT to an exec level or from an exec down to an IT level. Um, and then we'll have some recommendations and a summary. Okay, so in the beginning, way back in the day. This is where I started my IT career. Um, I worked for a city government. There's only about 350 users. So, you know, relatively small organization in my mind. Um, I did anything from desktop support, network administration, help desk. You know, I just basically was the IT guy for the organization. Here's what that turned into. Um, we had a few other people on the team, but this would be a typical conversation. When somebody had something wrong with the internet, they specifically said they'd call in or walk in person and say, hey, Question is, why is the internet down? And our tech guys, this would be an actual response, would be, oh, well, we thought it, we lost our network connection from the ISP, but actually one of the servers just crashed. And the response from the person asking questions was kind of like, what? What did you just say? I don't, I don't get that. So another example. Anybody seen one of these before? User, my computer just stopped working, and now it's blue. What the heck is going on here? Our IT guy. Oh. You have a BSOD, try restarting it. If that doesn't work, we'll just image it and rebuild it. Again, the user was like, Whoa, I don't get it. What, what exactly is BS what? I, I don't understand. So things that came out of that particular you know, years of experience was keeping it simple. Um, a good example of this, and this was many, many years ago, to set up those user profiles. Um, it was back in the Windows 98 days and NT. We had to actually set up the profiles. So we had the people's passwords. We logged in as them. So basically, they would go home at one night. It would look one way. Brand new machine, brand new build, brand new profi profile. They'd come in the next day, and it was exactly the same because we had built it, logged in as them, made sure everything worked, made sure icons were everything. We need to make it so simple that it was repetitive and easy. And that's going to be a theme through this is, is keeping that simple. Um, the other thing found out really quickly is that you guys, I'm sure everybody knows, not every quote unquote user is created equal. They all have different needs, they all have different ways to communicate, different questions. So, you know, that was a, that was a theme and that continues to be a theme throughout um, my career for sure. The other key here that, that I learned from that particular experience was listen and understand what that user problem was, but then also reiterate back to them in their terms but also using some technical uh, specifics, meaning you know, if, if they have a problem, instead of saying it's a BSOD, explain maybe what that actually is in more of their layman's terms. Um, and then use analogies. You know, I've got some examples of analogies in here. So the more stories you can tell, the more analogies people get it. 
So we fast forward. Um, I noticed that I think uh, Nick had some, he had a monkey in his slide, so I've got a couple monkeys in my slide, but I went into IT audit. I was an internal auditor. Um, got a fancy little badge, and this is what came out of audit. I would go and I'd work with the IT technical people, whether it be server admins, network admins, firewall admins, database administrators, wherever they were, and I'd have these type of questions, you know, specific access questions. You see some specifics in there around, you know, are there satisfactory procedures for reissuing passwords to users who have forgotten theirs? What's satisfactory really mean and procedures? What's this documentation? So, you know, as an auditor, I would expect people to give me information, give me responses. Tell me verbally, which is cool. Most people pass that audit test of, I'm going to explain how it's done, but see that supporting evidence of this is how it's documented, making sure it's the same. Um, so things started, started clicking in the IT audit world for me, and I started realizing that <clears throat> just getting a response of a yes, no, getting just a little bit of information of, oh yeah, we do that, um, here's how we do it, or if they really went into a real technical uh, speak around how they did it, I would have to understand that and figure out, well, how does that actually fit in the bigger picture? What does that actually mean, what you just said? Um, give me some more evidence. So you say you changed this port on the firewall. Okay, that's cool that you're telling me on that. It's cool that your documentation says that, but actually show me how you changed it. Give me that true picture of what it is. Because I needed to understand from an audit perspective why it was like that. Why do you have certain controls? Why do you not have certain controls? Why is this control better than that control? Um, so that was kind of just a very eye-opening experience of getting that evidence and getting that additional set of information. Again, it's, it built the awareness around getting more information. Um, the other kind of flip side of this that I found that was challenging that there was a lot of history that um, the previous people in the audit department would go in, do an audit, and they would leave, and they would go back the next time to do the audit again, and those people wouldn't give them any information because what was happening was the IT auditors would report up the organization, all of a sudden there was a finding that that group wasn't doing what they're supposed to, and now those people are like, well, I'm not gonna tell you anything because I, you just, you just you know, tore me apart last time. So, keeping that trust with the individual from an IT audit perspective, um, I utilize my technical background a lot in that particular position. Um, I remember one specific example that I had to uh, audit a firewall. Um, and this guy that ran the firewall had a very strong history of just going through auditors left and right because they would ask questions and they would either take his word for it or they'd ask really silly questions that, you know, they shouldn't been asking or they would go down a technical track and they wouldn't be able to understand. So what I did to prepare for this guy, the firewall admin, was I read, up, I read the entire book on whatever that firewall was, um, looked up controls on it, looked what other people audited, and really understood what that fire was all about. So when I went in to talk to him, he was thinking, oh great, newbie, I'm gonna burn through this guy too. We got into some pretty deep technical conversations and at the point where it got the end of it, he was like, hey, you know, this was actually the best audit. He revealed information that I didn't even ask for because he trusted that I had the IT experience. And then when I talked to him about, okay, well, here's what I'm thinking the findings are, does that really fit? I had that trust with him that he's like, yeah, that's totally legit. I'll fix that tomorrow or I'll fix that in the next week or I can't do it because of this, but you know, we had that relationship because I understood what he was saying. He was then relating it back to me. Once I had the full picture, then I can re relate it up the chain of command and have the appropriate audit finding as opposed to just, you know, you didn't do the password policy or you didn't do this documentation. So again, just reiterating, getting the whole full story and asking for more details, asking the why is really, really important. So that was kind of looking at from an IT audit perspective down to the person I was audit, the technical guy. Then on the flip side, I ran into issues because I would take these executive reports and report up to C-level people of what the findings were. And you can't just tell a CEO, hey, we've got a port open on this firewall and it's bad. They don't get that at all. What you had to do, or what I was successful with, was putting it all in terms of risk. Lots of conversations with management need to come back to risk because Management, executive management, understand risk. They understand financial risk. They understand insurance risk. They get risk. They get business risk. And so putting security in that world of risk was really important. So I would define what is the likelihood? Well, when is this going to actually happen? And not say the likelihood's red or the likelihood is a three. The likelihood is 
the translation of that, this will happen within the next six months based on industry standards, based on evidence, based on whatever that is. This will happen within the next year. Or you know what, this really probably won't happen in a, you know, any time in the next 10 years, I probably wouldn't worry about that. So that's kind of the likelihood of it. And then the impact piece of this, so okay, we know what's gonna happen in six months. What's that really mean? Is that gonna shut business down entirely? Is that some one person gonna be upset? Is it, you know, what is the true impact of this risk? And so lots of conversations I'd have with management would all come back to this table. Management loves colors. So it's easy for them to look at the color and say, oh, red, bad, green, good, okay. But then explaining to them what that red and green actually means from likelihood and impact. Next question that management would always cost or always ask, okay, if it's red, how much is it actually going to cost to go to that orangish color or go down to a yellow or, you know, well, we really want to go to a green on this. That's the very first question they would ask beyond anything of the details. And then beyond that, they want to know, well, okay, if it's going to cost me $2 million to go from red to a yellow, how many people are going to be involved? How much time is it going to take? What else is that going to include? Is it really worth it? So coming out of that, again, another monkey coming in, <clears throat> got me thinking quite a bit more, you know, after that IT audit job. Um, there was a lot of communication challenges. Again, that, that really set me in the middle of reporting up executive level and also reporting down from a technical level and being able to translate between the two. So, you know, I, it, it posed a lot of questions of how do I do this effectively? Um, one of the big gaps there was terminology differences, even from the technical side, it's for sure from the executive side. When you talked about a system or a box or a hardware or a hard drive or a computer, you know, the executive is just like that thing over there. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it does. I just know that that's kind of bad. So the terminology was just huge differences. Um, sometimes that took a little bit of education that no, Mr. Executive, that's a router, not a firewall, or that's a switch, not a hub, or whatever that might have been. Um, the other thing that was a challenge was, and I'll come to this a little bit later, is go, knowing the right amount of detail for that executive, I learned the hard lessons early on that I have this really long report and all this great information and gave the specifics, the executive would lose attention really quickly because they would get lost in all the details. Um, they would also get frustrated because they're like, what really is the problem? I need like one box or I need one page that really says all that 30 pages in one. I need it to be brief. I need to, I've got five minutes to understand what the heck you're trying to say and then I got to move on. So there was a lot of frustration both on their part because they didn't understand what I was saying and from my part because I wasn't communicating it correctly. So that kind of led into the start of some new magic words and we'll, we'll talk about magic words in a minute. But you know, on the left hand side here we have, um, on my left you have the, uh, the IT, more traditional terms. Right hand you have more kind of the traditional executive terms. And you can see there's not a whole lot of overlap between the two. So trying to find what those specific ones are is challenging. So we'll come back to that in a few minutes here. So <clears throat> I left an IT audit job, went in to get kind of a true security manager job. Um, when I got into security, a lot of the same themes came back from audit. We talked a lot about risk, we talked about governance, we talked about compliance. Um, there were specific standards that you had to understand. So it was a lot more, you had to do this and you, ha you couldn't do this. Um, I was responsible for security training. So again, going back to making sure what that message is, is consumable. I mean, how many people have gone through a security training and at the end, the people are like, what did I just watch? I, don't, I didn't get any of that. Having people actually retain it, and not just for a test right after the training, but six months down the road, you ask them, hey, what's a threat? Most time, they're not gonna get it. So that security training piece was, was a piece of that. Um, a huge piece of this job is, as, my, as a security manager was getting RFPs, getting re requests for proposals in, and the full proposal was sometimes 300 pages long. The specific section on security was only about three, three pages long, but there was traditionally anywhere from minimum of 15 to 20 up to like 200 questions about security. And it's not just an open-ended question of, hey, do you have a firewall? It's, okay, what ports do you allow on the firewall? And what audit you know, criteria do you use? And what standards do you follow? And where's your evidence? And you know, answering these RFP responses was a huge, huge challenge in this particular role. 
Um, so understanding what the needs were and then being able to answer it correctly. Again, it goes back to that translation. So part of that and, and <clears throat> um, part of coming onto that was communicating the IT, um, communicating beyond IT, and also including that security ter terminology. So um, IT terminology is one thing, security terminology is even yet another one. And so having to add that layer of complexity to translate what a security threat would be, what a vulnerability was, again, what risk is, to both people inside the organization, up the organization, down the organization, and to customers. Again, start adding more complexity into it. Um, those external resources, uh, audit, again, working with audits quite a bit more, um, telling the story in terms of they could, that, that they could um, understand. The other thing that was challenging with this particular position was I went from an audit position where basically as an auditor I could tell people, hey, you need to have a password policy that says it has to be 25 characters. And them as the auditee didn't really get much choice in it, whether they like it or not. A lot of times they were like, oh, fine, okay, they would do it. This one was a little bit different in that it was sometimes a checkbox for compliance because we had to do it versus we really need to do the right thing. Um, and the right thing sometimes was a lot more effort, a lot more time, a lot more money. So that was a challenge to explain why we need to do it one way versus another. This was an interesting little hiatus I had. I, I went off for a um, year and a half and got out of the security world, out of the aud audit world, which I knew and was very familiar with and very good at, to go and being an HR executive at a, 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 a pretty large company. Um, you might say, well, how did that transition happen? Well, I think some of it was the fact that I knew technology, I knew the executives, they knew that I could explain to them what exactly was going on, and there was a huge, huge problem with the HR technology that was out there. Um, my role in this job was to go out and find every piece of HR technology in the organization. And again, this was a very large company. There was like 3,000 HR related technologies out there ranging from we track on a spreadsheet to we've got a very complex system. This little chart on the on the right hand side kind of shows just some of the systems out there. The company probably had just about every single one of these. And so my role was to do a few things. The first one was figure out what all those systems were. And then once I figured out what those systems were, what they actually did, and then I'd have to summarize that to be able to say we've got 13 recruiting systems, here's what they all do, here's how much they cost, here's, our, the, here's the ROI, which we'll come back to, the revert, uh, return on investment, so we're paying a million dollars to buy them or use them, but we're only getting $200,000 $200, worth of actual return on it based on you know, metrics. Um, then I'd have to figure out those 13 recruiting systems, can we consolidate down to one, can we consolidate onto two? Will they work together? What's the best of breed? So this was like a huge, huge activity to be able to take IT and executive re requirements and save money, make it more efficient, and actually at the end of the day, make it better. So at the time that I took it, I thought, okay, fine, it's, it's interesting. At, when I got done with that, I left that position. I was like, why did I do that? Looking back now and reflecting, it was actually a really good experience because Again, it was similar to the audit role and you had to translate up and down the organization. So, <clears throat> here's some of the lessons I learned from that particular experience. HR doesn't understand technology very well. Um, I think that's a pretty, pretty good blanket statement. Next one, many high level executives also don't understand technology very well um, because I really had to test my reporting and reporting concise and details and get to the point. Um, I also really learned the importance of explaining actual costs and the return on investment. So are we really getting what we're paying for? Or is this one that was free actually give us the best benefit? Um, and then the really the, the probably the most challenging piece of this particular role was how do all those 3,000 systems fit together in the bigger picture? Why is this system Recruiting and this one is onboarding and what's the difference and why do we have both and why is it managed different in this location versus that location? So being able to tell that in a big picture was really really challenging So I left HR management executive level and went into more of the security and privacy officer position um, 
So I went from a manager to an officer level, which again, gained more responsibilities. Um, you see some, some of the mind map here that is an example of just all the different things a CISO would do. Uh, and that kind of fast forwards to my current role. And really what I'm doing now with, with a startup company is demonstrating how it's supposed to be done. Using our company as a showcase to say, okay, there's a way to do it and there's a way to do it right. So we're gonna show you the right way to do it. That takes a lot of work. And then being able to explain why we did this particular firewall versus that firewall. Why we open this port, why we don't open this port. Why we have this for identity access management, but we don't have that. So having all these things in place, again, and it's not just knowing it for our organization, but to be able to tell customers about it and have them buy into it and have them understand it. And then also have them say, yeah, that makes sense. And you know, we should do that here. Um, so again, this whole translation piece comes back, comes back over and over. Um, every client has a different problem they're trying to solve. Um, and it's really not the tool that's the solution. A lot of times it's how you implement it, what you need to implement. Tool agnostic, they've still got the same problem. Um, also found out from this particular role is that uh, the ability to fully explain something and then support why you need to do it one way as opposed to we get many clients that say, hey, I just need to be HIPAA compliant Whatever we get those check boxes done, that's all I want to do. I don't want to do whatever is best practice. I don't care if I have a, you know, my front door is unlocked. As long as I can say I'm HIPAA compliant, that's all I need. And so that's a really hard conversation to say, well, you might want to put that lock on the front door and this is why. Um, helping them understand risk management. This theme of risk management keeps coming in over and over and over again. And then expand, exp uh, responding to questions of why and then again the ROI piece. So. Here's what all those stories kind of come together and this is kind of the recommendations or, or where it fits. So the keys to successful communications, telling a story, having that good story to tell, using analogies and examples, which we'll go through. Um, finding out what words are triggers for both sides of the coin. So knowing what word will then spark an interest in either an IT person or an executive. Um, and then finally creating that bridge, putting yourself in their shoes. What do they really need to know? What do they not need to know? Where are you just the expert? And if you can prove that you're expert, then they will just say, okay, I get it. I'm listening to you. You're the expert. I'll do what you say. So here's an example of telling a story. Um, walking through this. So this is an example of a bank and two-factor authentication. So this was part of one of the trainings um, that we had done. And it was explaining the difference between a threat, the, uh, the vulnerability, the threat, the incident, and the actual breach. So you have an online checking account, weak password, that's a vulnerability. Um, a threat, hacker could use a tool to guess that password, that might be a threat. You have some controls in place to hopefully would stop that. That's where your two-factor authentication would come in. If it doesn't stop it, you just keep that weak password. The incident is that would able to bypass those controls, um, view account data, compromise confidentiality, that's your incident, and actually the breach is they would steal the data. Um, take the money, whatever that might be. So using that analogy of a checking account has people understanding it as opposed to saying, well, a security vulnerability is a CSS score of this and it needs to do this and it needs to do this. And the threat is that some bad guy might do this. Normal users aren't gonna get that for the most part. They'll understand breach probably. They'll say, oh, I hear about that breach in the paper, but they won't know the difference between a breach and an incident. Another example, explaining distributed denial of service. Um, so try explaining that to somebody who doesn't know anything about computers. This is a challenge. So the analogy that I've used in the past is think about going on the interstate. Everybody's done it, right? You know how it works, except this, normally it's good, except for this day, whatever reason, the traffic on the interstate is completely jammed. Don't know what's going on, just know it's completely jammed. People are like, okay, I can, I can envision that. Nobody can get on, nobody can get off. All right, okay. I'm sitting in traffic, it's jammed, I understand. Um, that's your denial of service. It means you can't do anything else. It completely locks everything up. Eventually, it will clear out, hopefully, and you can get off the interstate. And they're like, oh, okay, I get that. Obviously, you gotta fill in the holes a little bit more there, but the analogy they will get, they'll understand getting on the interstate, as opposed to you tell them the technical components of it, and this is how it actually works. You overflow with packets, and you do this and you do this, and they're like, whoa, what? What's a packet? I don't get it. So. Magic words, buzzwords. 
So you might hear these thrown around the office, maybe hear executives' reports with this. Um, but, you know, they want, most executives want you to think outside the box. Well, what's that really mean? Um, hit, you hit the nail ahead on that one. Can you please go on a deeper dive? It's a game changer. This is a, I hear this a lot. Don't boil the ocean. Don't try to do everything. But yet we want that quick win. Okay? Hit that low-hanging fruit. That's a return on investment again. So these are some buzzwords that you might hear thrown around. Specific security buzzwords, um, confidentiality, availability, integrity, the CIA. Um, a lot of executives won't really get that. You know, it's more that we talk about in security. Um, risk, that is one where actually it is pretty, con it pretty, um, pretty effective across both sides. The specific technologies, the tools. You go into a specific tool or a specific technology, people aren't going to get that. Um, and then uh, I threw in their budget as, as a security magic word. So if you're trying to get your point across and you throw budget in there or looking for budget or need budget, that seems like that comes up quite a bit. Magic words for executives. So a little bit different flavor. They want to hear things like strategy. Where does this fit in the overall strategy? How does this fit with our two-year plan, our three-year plan, our next six months? Where is the strategy? Um, what's the risk? What's the cost? Is this going to be profitable? That's a great conversation with an executive, trying to, trying to have them understand that putting in a IDS is profitable. They don't get it. They don't understand because it doesn't make them money. They can't see a check coming in. So if you try to do it on the other side, say, well, this is how it's going to decrease the risk, they'll say, well, how much, okay, if it didn't make us money, how much did it save? Well, it didn't do that either. So what's that really look like from a cost perspective? You have to, you have to you know, play around with what those needs are a little bit um, or from a profitability standpoint. So schedule, timeline. That's another question that we'll ask is, well, how long is this going to take? And at the end of the day, we put that new IDS, IPS in, what are the deliverables? What is actually in the, the day? What's needed? Um, and then the last question is, a lot of times from the executive side, well, okay, we do all these things. I get it. How does it impact that end customer, that end user? Is it going to make it slower for them, faster than for them? Is someone going to call me and complain about it? You know, what are, what are this, what's the impact to that end customer? So knowing that these are kind of the triggers for that executive is important to know so that you handle that in, in the recommendations. So bridging the gap. Um, I took a lot of these images from places I find. I really like this one that you have your nice fancy bow tie, but it's all in, in uh, cables. But, you know, understanding what technology actually does and how it fits into the bigger picture. So that's one of the keys to bridging these gaps. Most executives don't want to understand the bits and the bytes. But if you show that this is how it fits into the bigger picture, this is how it fits into the strategy, that will help them understand why it's important. Um, how it relates to other technologies. So we, we have an IDS, and you kind of maybe understand what that means. We also have DLP, or maybe we have a firewall that does this, but we have this other device that does something similar. Um, and then asking the right questions to get the right answers. Um, if you have that Q&A section with the, with the executive, making sure that whatever, an, whatever question they would ask, you have the right answer from the technology perspective, but also an answer that they're going to understand. So <clears throat> this, is, uh, this is going from the executive level. Uh, down, this is what IT should do to communicate up to the executive. Start with a headline. Very first thing is throw, throw a headline out there. This is what we're really talking about. Don't go straight into the details. Um, provide the purpose and the impact. That's really that why and make it very short and to the point. Um, bring in the strategy connection, you know, as, as I said before. Our strategy is to grow by X. If we do this, this is how it relates to it. If you can't make that strategy connection with, with what you're trying to accomplish or whatever that IT is, or whatever that problem is, um, or how you can't get to the strategy because you have a problem in IT, you're probably going to lose that executive. The budget and the costs. They will always ask about budgets and costs. If you don't have that in there, if you don't understand what they mean, or if they're not accurate, it's really going to cost $5, but you don't want to tell them that, so you tell them a dollar, that's not going to go over well. Um, impact to customer, schedule, and then really focus on the future as opposed to the past. Many times executives don't want to hear, we've had three years of this problem and we just need to fix it. And they're like, no. If you say, well, in the next three years, we're going to be able to do A, B, C, and D because we do this, 
that's forward thinking, that provides more emphasis to your solution or, or what you're trying to accomplish there. So the executives will respond much, much better to those things. Okay, going um, a little bit further here. So don't spend too much time on the details, but have them prepared for the questions. Um, brevity is very important here. Get right to the point. Um, make sure you get enough information that executives so they know exactly what they need to make a decision. Um, it seems like time after time when you have to have multiple conversations over the same thing, you don't get as much success as opposed to if you give them enough information right off the bat to be able to make a decision, they can then do that and get it back to you quickly or get back to you right in the spot there. Um, think like an executive. Think, okay, if I'm running this company, what exactly do I need to hear? What's important? I know the bits and bytes are important, but what if from an executive perspective, if they've got 100 things to think about, what's really important about this particular issue? And then communicate like an executive. You know, look at what kind of terminology, um, look at what kind of styles they use. So, this will be for all my executives in the room, so this is going to be a little, a little different, but, you know, I also put the expectation on the executive. You can't always blame IT for being the problem or blame security for being the problem. Um, from an executive level, you need to make sure that you pass out and say, look, when you meet with me, this is how much time you have. You have five minutes to get your point across. So the person's not preparing for two hours. Um, this is how I want to be communicated. I want you to send me an email, or I want it just to be a presentation, or I want a summary. Send me a text. I had several executives I worked with that you would send them an email, nothing. You'd send them a text, and you'd get a response like that. So it's knowing what that person needs from a communication style. Um, ask for examples or analogies. So if you're an executive and you're trying to understand from a technology perspective, say, okay, I really don't get what you're saying. Give me a different example. And then do some research. I got these books up here, just as examples that, you know, from an executive side, you should take some ownership because IT is certainly, and security is a certain part of the organization. Know what the heck that really means. It doesn't mean you have to configure, you know, a specific system, but you need to understand the high level what, what things are. So recommendations at an entry level. So if you're just starting out, in the field of other IT or security, these are some things to maybe think about as you move forward. So try to understand more than just your specialty. Learn, learn, learn. Um, I run into a lot of people that they're like, you know, I'm a, I'm a pen tester. I'm only a pen tester. That's all I do, and I don't do anything else. I don't want to understand any of the strategy stuff. I don't want to understand anything over here on defensive. I don't want to understand. No, you need to, you know, you need to expand out and learn the broader sense of what IT is, what security is, and even from an organization perspective, if you can, you know, that's kind of getting to that next level. Um, job shadow or an internship. Get more senior level mentor. Get an actual mentor in the field. Get somebody that's an expert to give you some advice. Um, usually people that get to a senior level are more than happy to do mentorships and, you know, provide some examples, get some of those lessons learned out there. Ask for analogies and ask for feedback. So as an entry level, these are some things that you can do right now, even if, even if you don't know everything. Something you can do, you know, right now you can start doing these things. As you move up the chain, more of a mid-level, um, this is the point where you should hopefully start understanding the business strategy. Um, being able to explain that strategy, understand where you fit into it, understand where your team fits into it, understand where your peers fit into it. Um, get a good understanding of risk management. Understand the likelihood and the impact. Um, start or join a peer mentoring group. Um, and this really is around if you are the help desk guy, start net meeting and networking with the networking guys, with the development guys. You know, cross laterally at your level, get that relationship and have them understand what you do and what they do also. So you get that relationship, you get an understanding of what everybody's doing. Um, and then also build relationships with finance, HR, audit, legal, et cetera. So go beyond just IT. Have those connections in all the other different departments if you have an organization big enough to have those. Um, at an executive level, so looking from the top down, these are the things that I would give recommendations from an executive level what they should be doing. Get educated. Take classes in IT. Take classes in security and privacy. Um, meet with multiple, multiple layers of security, not just management. I see this quite often that you know, your C-level person is just meeting with your director of IT or your director of X, X particular area. Um, not very often does the CEO go down and talk to the programmer. And I think that's kind of a, a miss. You know, I know they're busy, but 
understand really what every person in the organization, a, as much as possible, what they contribute. Um, you get that kind of involvement and you get people to understand that, look, you're not just a number, you're actually here for a reason. That's really important. Um, a good recommendation I have for an executive is get involved with an incident from a security side and get involved with incident response. Not just when it happens, um, not just when you get that high level report that, oh, we just, had a, we just had a little blip yesterday and the executive is okay, no big deal. But actually go from that process from beginning to the end. Um, nothing frustrates me more than when something comes out of the blue and you're not sure what happened beforehand, you think that's just easy. Um, if they're involved with that incident response process, they'll start getting appreciation of, whoa, this is actually really complicated. Actually, there's a lot of pieces in here. And, okay, I understand that you did forensics work. I get that now. Um, last thing for an executive level, go to conferences. Go to Black Hat. Go to DEF CON. Go to Corn Con, which is just here in Iowa. Um, you know, getting your eyes exposed to the capabilities out there. You know, a lot of times I'll talk with executives and, and they're like, oh, security, you know. That's, that's like that Home Depot thing, and that's like Anthem, and that won't happen to us. And, you know, there's only a couple people out there that actually can do this, right? It's like, no, you need to go to a DEF CON. You need to go to a Black Hat. Well, before you go, you need to do this before you go. You know, don't do this, don't do this. But when you go there, get your eyes open to the capabilities of this community. It's amazing. It's scary amazing. So that would be my executive level recommendations. In summary, wrapping things up, um, you know, tell stories. Use examples, analogies. Think and speak alike. Put yourself in the other person's shoes. Whether you're an executive looking down at IT or IT looking up at an executive level, put yourself in their shoes. What do you really need to know? And then if you're in an IT looking up at an executive level and you think you need to take up an hour, realize that executive maybe only has five minutes. So you need to condense it down. Put yourself in their shoes. Really focus on delivery and style. Get all the details so you've got enough information most people in this field get that. They have the details. Focus on the overall strategy and then provide the question of why. The answers to why. That's me. I'll open up for questions. Anybody else challenge with this area? Specific challenges? Yeah. Do you have any recommendations for specific metrics or how to communicate metrics to Yeah, so um, the questions are on metrics. So uh, there's, there's lots of different metrics and maturity models out there. Um, I haven't found one that I really fell in love with. So what I did was actually create my own maturity matrix that would show this is what good is and how to measure good. This is what not good is and how to measure good. So um, you know, there's not specific ones, depending on what you're trying to get across. There, there's, you know, each one has a metric, but metrics is a hard one. Um, and especially doing the ROI, that's a hard one to actually give a, this is a, a three out of a five. Usually I'll get that out of more of IT audit type questions of the responses, but yeah, metrics is a hard one. So I don't have a specific, you go to this particular website. Other questions? Yeah. Do you have any uh, recommendations for those that work specifically within product security as opposed to IT security? Because executives in that area would always see security as a cost, right? Yeah. Um, I would say from the product side, the hook into the executive is the impact to the customer. And, and really showing that, um, you know, maybe with sp more specifics on products, it might be better to understand. But, you know, if, if you can explain from a customer perspective, how you're going to make it easier, better, faster for them, usually those things will sometimes equate to you can, you can charge more money for this product because it's going to make it easier, it's going to make it faster. But yeah, security is a hard one to, to respond to from an executive level or, or you know, support the <coughs> costs um, at an executive level from, from products for sure. Others? else? I had a question. Sure. Um, this one, I mean, it's kind of a weird situation because I'm, I'm more on the vendor side of the dirty, dirty vendor trying to get in front of the, the, the C-suite. Um, 
the message and what to convey, this was excellent. Um, I think it clarified a lot of things that maybe I'd be mistaken in doing, being a little overly technical with the execs and things like that, but what's the best way to get a seat at that table? How to initiate that conversation and get that, get your, uh, get your time with the executives? From an outside vendor perspective? Yeah, what would you recommend? Um, yeah, so kind of the question is, from an outside vendor perspective, how do you successfully get into that company to get your product in there, get your service in there? Um, what's been successful with us, um, there's a couple different things. One, it's, it's building that relationship so they trust that you know what you're doing, you're doing it on behalf of them, as opposed to just pushing a product just to make a buck. Um, having confidence that your product actually will solve their problems and know where it fits into their organizational strategy. Um, again, I would go back to looking at, you know, depending on how big the company is, you can probably figure out um, where direction they're going, what strategy, what major components they have, and if you can fit your product into that, that's usually a really good hook. But actually getting in front of them, relationships, knowing people, um, having a good story to tell, and referrals usually are the, are the key for us to be able to get in. Um, sometimes, you know, sometimes situations will happen where there'll be a local incident, that's another good time to be like, hey, just as a reminder, we're here to help you out. Sometimes you gotta take advantage of those incidents. Others? Anything else? Cool. Well, I thank you for your time. Appreciate it, guys.